My name is Chris Comstock, and I'll be your MC for this evening. I've been seeing at UC Santa Barbara. Um, tonight, though, I'm coming to you from Santa Monica, California, so keeping it real in California. Just a little bit about Summer Connect uh, while we're waiting. Uh, our heart is really to keep as many students, as many of you, as connected to Christian community and really connected to the mission of CREW, which really is Christ's mission to make disciples of the nations. That's really our heart. That's really the vision and the goal of Summer Connect. Uh, because we want you to walk with Jesus, not only this summer, but for a lifetime. We want you to be a disciple, learning how to live your life from him, uh, living his kind of life out in your context, wherever you find yourself. So that's really the goal for Summer Connect. That's our vision. Um, and some, Sunday Night Live is really just a part of that. So now we get to transition to our mission spotlight. So like I mentioned, there's people logging in from all over the world. And tonight we have a few friends that are logging in from uh, a lesser known Latin American country, but a country I've always been curious about, so I'm excited to hear from them. Um, they're coming all the way from Uruguay uh, to meet us here tonight at Sunday Night Live. Um, and so uh, we are going to be welcoming with us um, Abby and Evelyn. And Abby has been thinking for the past two years down in Uruguay. And she went to the University of Minnesota, study biology and Spanish, which I'm sure the Spanish part was quite helpful. Um, and she's lived two years down there now in Uruguay. And then we're also going to hear from Evelyn, who is Uruguayan, actually, and she has studied psychology, and she's hoping to be a uh, school psychologist at some point. She's working with a few people now, and hopefully we'll get a job in a, in a school soon. So, um, Abby, Evelyn, welcome <laughs> to Sunday Night Live. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having us. I'm really excited to be able to be a part of it and share what God's doing here. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about how God called me here, seeing that you guys are going to be talking about story and whatever else today as the, as the message. So um, that and then share what God's doing here. And then Evelyn's also going to share her story um, with you guys about how crew has impacted her. Can you hear everything okay from us? Hey, sound good. Or, Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I, like you said, I'm from the University of Minnesota, and I first came to Uruguay as a project after my sophomore year of college. And I basically came because I was studying Spanish, and I kind of thought, like, it might be cool. Um, but God really opened my eyes to see, like, the need for the gospel here, and to see really how much he loves the world. Like, that was the first time that I understood, like, wow, the world is so big, and God is everywhere. Like, this is so cool. And I came back to the States and still was kind of on the, like, I'm going to go to med school. I have all these plans. Like, really still had to surrender my future um, to the Lord and wasn't thinking about sin at all then. Um, but as the year went on, my junior year of college and um, some year when came up to my winter conference that year and just hearing, like, their testimonies, hearing how, like, crew there has been impacting their lives and just thinking more and more about like, okay, I could do a year after I graduate. Um, God just slowly worked in my heart to bring me to a place of like, all right, like, we'll go wherever. Like, I, can, I can do this. And so I think he just used a lot of things like my studying Spanish, volunteering in the Latino community in my city, um, being more involved with cute crew just at my university and just seeing the need, um, hearing more about your way, just little by little, it just seemed like the logical next step for me um, to come here, and it's been just a really awesome um, opportunity, just being, I don't know, understanding a lot more about who he is, learning from another culture who are also created in his image, and just seeing how they love the Lord differently than us, and I don't know, taught me a lot about who God is, and it's been really, really wonderful experience. Um, I think... The biggest thing about Uruguay is just a lot of misconceptions that people have. And so understanding more about it was also um, part of the reason that I wanted to come here. So as Latin American countries, we often think that they're Catholic. Like we just think, okay, Mexico, Latin America, like they're Catholic, and so they know the Lord kind of. Um, but here, it's really not like that at all. So the neighboring countries are maybe 70, 90% Catholic. And Uruguay is about 30%. And so 30% Catholic and about 5% um, evangelical Christians. And so that was just like mind blowing. Like, what happened in this little tiny country that nobody knows the Lord? Um, and then also with that, it has like the highest rate of depression and the highest rate of suicide in all of Latin America. And I think like one of like top five, top 10, um, I think top 
think it's like number six in the world. And so just seeing that you see this this country with people with very little hope in anything, you know, they don't have a religion, they don't have hope in um, any God, or obviously not like Jesus who gives life. And so just seeing that there's a really high suicide rate, lots of depression, and lots of people just living without hope. And so being able to come here, going on campus, like we get to meet students all the time who can tell us like, oh, I haven't thought about God in 10 years. And so it is a little bit hard spiritually, and so that's something I would ask for prayer from you guys is just be praying for students' hearts here, um, that they could be more open to the gospel, that they could be um, more aware of their sin and just more aware of their need for a savior. Um, and just that like all of their, I don't know, really like atheist, humanist, just a lot of skepticism, that that would just be taken away from their hearts and that they would be ready um, to hear the gospel, I think. Um, but some cool things, we're definitely seeing people trust Christ. We're definitely seeing um, believers get involved with the movement and take steps of faith, like share their faith for the first time on campus. And um, that's been really, really fun. And another big thing is for Crew Latin America, they're having a huge conference in July. And we were hoping to get 15 year grants to go to this conference. And that was like, a huge number for us, like, okay, this is going to be crazy, um, because many people have never left this country, they've never traveled anywhere, and so, and the plane ticket for us is really expensive to get to where the conference is, because we're very far away, um, but we have 17 students signed up, and so that's a huge praise, and if you guys could just be praying for the conference, it's called Solo Uno, um, which means, like, only one, and they're focusing on one God, one community, this is all these Latin American countries together, and then one mission, which is obviously the Great Commission, and to be able to share our faith with others and um, trying to create partnerships within Latin America so other students can go share the gospel in different countries and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I would say just be praying for the students' hearts here and then be praying for this conference and just for all of the details that go behind it and all the finances that our students are trying to raise, support, and stuff like that. Yeah. And then pass it over to Evelyn. She's going to share a little bit about just how God has used crew in her life. Okay. Um, my name is Evelyn. I study psychology and I met people from crew two years ago, but I never went to, to the meeting until I met Abby. <laughs> and she took me uh, to the weekly meeting. And then <clears throat> she she helped me to buy my first Bible. And before this, I, I believe in God, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't read the Bible. I didn't know um, other young people, uh, other Christian people. And I didn't have any place to to go or learn and and yeah, learn more about God. Who <laughs> um, uh, gave me the a place to to learn and to know uh, young people who believe in God and. I start to read the Bible with Abby, <laughs> and um, now I think uh, I think things uh, that I never used to, and uh, I think my relationship with God is more closer, and uh, I'm happy for this. <laughs> So thank you and <laughs> sorry for my English. <laughs> oh, that's, great. that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abby and Evelyn, for sharing. And Evelyn, your yes. English is great. Your English is great. And <laughs> thank you. It's even better. Yeah. Um, yeah, just so thankful for you both. Uh, Abby, thanks for taking two years of your life and investing in the lives of Brazilian <laughs> people. And Evelyn being the fruit of that labor. And Evelyn. <laughs> We're excited, Evelyn, for you to continue to grow in Christ and then to introduce your friends and other people that you know to know Jesus better, too. So um, yeah. we would love to take a moment just to pray for you both and for the ministry there. And so you're going to have hundreds of people around the world praying for you in Uruguay. 
in this moment. So um, let's, let's, let's enter in some prayer. Um, again, if people, if you're driving out there, keep your eyes open while you pray and, uh, you can, you can join us. So let me, let me pray for you both. Um, sure. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Abby and for Evelyn and for just them stepping out in faith and trusting you with their lives, for Abby for taking two years of her life and moving down to Uruguay and uh, giving her life away and sharing you with, with people like Evelyn. Um, thank you for softening the hearts and minds of the Uruguayan people. We pray you continue to do that, that you would keep their minds open to the things of God and that you keep their hearts soft, Holy Spirit, when you when you speak to them, that they would be able to have ears to hear and they would respond. And thank you for Evelyn, that she responded to you, Jesus. And I pray you continue to help her in her growth, that she pursue you uh, and look more and more like you daily. And, Lord, we do want to pray for the upcoming Solo Uno conference. Um, Lord, it, it is only you. You alone um, is what we're about, and you're the only one who brings life. And so I pray that this conference would uh, ground those students who are going in their faith, um, that they get to know you better. They would be connected to one another in Christian community, and they would come back from this conference even more excited and passionate about you than when they left. And so we pray for those 17 students that they're sending. Um, would you resource them, provide the support they need, uh, the plane tickets they need, uh, the, the meals they're going to need. Would you provide everything they need for, the, for that conference, God, and then some. Uh, and then, Lord, we do just pray for an awakening in the country of Uruguay. Um, we pray that that 35% number of people who have been exposed to you, Jesus, uh, would grow and grow and grow and multiply uh, into a movement of people who um, would claim your name as your disciple. That's our prayer, Lord. Would you produce fruit uh, and create an awakening in that country? And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you both. Have a wonderful evening. And, uh, yeah. yeah, bless you. Thanks. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Um, thankful for people all over the world who are giving their lives away um, to the mission to uh, share Jesus with uh, people who've never heard of him before or have not been exposed uh, to authentic followers of Jesus. And that's what's going on in Uruguay and all over the world. So um, excited to hear stories like that. And you'll be hearing more stories like that as the weeks go on. So now we are going to transition to our keynote speaker for the evening. But before we do that, uh, we want to do a little more interactivity. And so we are going to put up uh, another poll question for you before we bring up our, our keynote speaker. Uh, and that poll has to do with um, you getting to know other people. So here's the question. When you meet others for the first time, how do you help them get to know you? So what's most important for them to know about you? Uh, maybe the very beginning of your life, are you the kind of person who says, well, I was born in San Luis Obispo, and I was eight pounds, six ounces, and you got to go back that far? Um, are you, or maybe you just need, they just need to know the relevant path, maybe the last year or two of your life, and maybe some of the events that's going on. Or maybe it's what you're going through currently, and that's how you help people get to know you. Uh, or, or maybe it's your future aspirations, your hopes and dreams for the future. So take a minute and answer that question of what do you do to help people get to know you better? What do they need to know? So that's really what we want to do is connect people together here. So that would be good to know. <clears throat> Fill that out. And then while you're filling that out, I want to introduce our speaker. So keep one ear open on that. Um, our speaker for tonight is Matt Michelados. Uh, and Matt has been on staff with Crew for the past 15 years. He graduated from Western Seminary, and he lives currently in Portland, Oregon, and uh, is married to one wife, which is always a good thing. He's got three daughters and then three kittens, actually. Yes, three kittens, uh, which I guess at some point they won't be kittens anymore. That introduction off the chain. But uh, Matt is passionate about helping people have a fresh experience with Jesus. Um, and that comes through when he speaks. He's also a, a prolific author. He's written several books. Uh, you may have heard of some of them. Uh, one is called The First Time We Saw Him, and it's a book about Jesus in the 21st century. Uh, he also has some kind of comedy theology novels. Um, you may have heard of Night of the Living Dead Christian or Imaginary Jesus. We've given out a lot of Imaginary Jesus books, Jesus books on our campus, so you may have gotten some on yours. And he also has a fantasy novel called The Swords of Six Worlds, 
and a book on the way, believe it or not, called Sky Lantern, coming out in November. So get on Amazon after Summer Connect and type in Matt Nicolás' name and pick some of those books up. Um, well, let's look briefly at the poll results before we actually have them come speak to us. What, what do we got for the results here? Okay, man, so most of you are saying uh, what is currently going on is the most important thing to share uh, when you're trying to get somebody to get to know you, and then the very relevant past is, is close second. Uh, apparently, nobody really shares where they were born or how much they weighed at birth, but that's all right. Um, that makes sense. So, yeah, right on. So. Make sure you guys are sharing your, your relevant past and your current situation with each other. You're getting to know one another. So now uh, we get to transition to our keynote speaker. Um, so let's welcome Matt. I know you're clapping where you're at. Give him a hand. Uh, Matt Michelotis, take it away, brother. Thank you. I, uh, I have some bad news about the three kittens. Oh, no. They were, uh, they were eaten by coyotes. <laughs> they come to they're not growing up, I guess, is the short part. Well, that's a good way to start a talk, isn't it? Let's start with a story. Once there was a boy named Harry whose parents had died when he was very young, and he was sent to live with his aunt and uncle and his cousin. And it was a pretty terrible life. They made him live under the uh, stairs in the house in a tiny room. But uh, one day, a giant came in. Well, a half giant, really, and brought with him an invitation to come be part of a secret magic school. And Harry thought about it a lot, and then he decided he really hated school, and he wasn't really very interested. And so he said, I think I'll pass on that. And uh, as he grew older, he eventually got old enough to move out of his aunt and uncle's house. And uh, he became a computer programmer, and the end. That's the story of the young man, you might recognize it, named Harry Potter. Uh, now, most of, us, most of us know that that's not a very good story, because at the core of it, we actually all are pretty hardwired to understand story. And that's why when your friend says, hey, guess what? I have a story to tell you. I went to the mall today. You follow up by saying, and then what happened, right? Because I went to the mall today is not really a story. It's more like just some information. And what we're going to talk about tonight is what does it mean for the good news, the gospel of Jesus, to be a story? And, uh, you know, people have different theories about story and how it works. Some people say every story should have conflict, right? So that story I told you about Harry, there's not much conflict. He just kind of grows up and moves away. So it's not very interesting. Uh, but there's a woman named Ursula K. Le Guin, who's actually a really famous science fiction and fantasy writer. She would say it's not so much conflict. Conflict's important. Uh, and it often creates things in a story that's interesting. But what's really interesting, what's necessary in a story is not conflict, but that the story must have change, uh, transformation, that a culture or character or something must be transformed by the story's end for it to be satisfying. So we're going to talk some about that tonight. So I'm going to talk with you about three things. The first is I'm going to just get all geeky and talk with you about story structure theory. I was a writing major in college and we spent a lot of time on this. So it's just a framework to discuss story. So we're gonna talk about that. And then we're gonna talk about the gospel, the good news of Jesus as a story and why that's important, how that works. We're gonna take a look at it. And then we're gonna talk about your story, you personally, your story and the good news, your story and the gospel and uh, why that matters. So just real quick, Chris already mentioned some of this, but let me just tell you why I'm qualified to talk about these things, okay? I'm writing major, lots of, yeah, written lots of books. I go to all the movies. Look, I read a lot of Batman comics. That helps me know about story. Uh, there's so many things, and uh, my kids read a lot of books and tell me endlessly about them, so there's always that. Um, but yeah, so... What was your favorite story when you were a kid? Just think about it for a minute. What story did you just beg to have read to you over and over? Uh, for me, and this might be revelatory about my own psyche, 
But for me, it was this story about this cat who ate everything he saw. It's like this old Danish folk tale, I guess. The story goes that this cat goes out walking one day and sees two birds. And the birds are like, good morning, cat. And then he eats the birds. And then he keeps walking. He meets three more birds. He eats them. He meets, a, I can't remember what else, a dog. He eats the dog. He meets an old lady. He eats the old lady. He eats all the food he finds. He just eats everything. And that the story at the end, someone comes and, uh, you know, gets everything out of the cat. It's a terrible story, but I loved it as a kid, and I wanted to hear it over and over. And for you, it might be where the wild things are, or uh, who knows, who knows, uh, green eggs and ham. Maybe you like being told to try new foods. But these stories stick with us as we get older. And here's the thing about the good news. You cannot share the good news about Jesus, the gospel. You cannot do it without story. It's not possible. And if you look, for instance, at the book of Acts, where we see a lots of people uh, telling the story about Jesus or telling others how to follow him, almost without exception, they do it by telling a story, the story of Jesus. So that, that's going to be pretty important. So let's start first with talking about uh, story structure. What we're going to look at is five-act story structure, which is something that was uh, come up with by this German guy named Gustav. Uh, he, uh, he was, he was famous for his, uh, he was famous as a playwright as well as a critic. Uh, Gustav Freytag was his name. And this, if you look on the whiteboard, is uh, what's called uh, Freytag's Triangle. Now, there's lots of different ways we talk about story and how it works, and this is just one of them. So Hollywood uses three-act story structure. Uh, Christians have largely been influenced by people like Don Miller, who's been largely influenced by a book called Story uh, and, and has a slightly different way of looking at things than this. There are people who use mythology, mythological story structure, but this is just for convenience to make it easy as we go through talking about this. So there's going to be five points because it's five-act story structure, and it works like this. The first thing is the preliminary situation, and preliminary situation just means, all it means is, what is true before the story starts? Uh, you know, so for Harry Potter, it would be that his parents have passed, but he's living with his family now. And then, so, well, with his aunt and uncle, right? That's the preliminary situation. The story hasn't begun. There's nothing, that's like I decided to go to the mall today. Nothing has happened. Uh, but then point two, the second act, uh, is what we call the initial incident. And the initial incident is what starts the story. Uh, so for Harry, it's when uh, the, uh, the half giant comes bursting into his family's house uh, and says, I, I have good news for you. You can come to magic school, which again, school still. I, I don't think Harry thought about that enough. The so the initial incident gets it gets the story going. It's when Luke Skywalker finds out uh, that someone needs his help. It's when uh, Jane, uh, you know characters in Jane Austen books find out that they might be able to find a husband. Uh, it's when uh, Walt discovers that maybe by selling drugs he can make enough money to take care of his family. It doesn't matter. It's what starts the story. The next thing that comes or what we call the crises, the third thing. The crises are purely the problems that come for our main character, what gets in their way. So for Harry, it's things like as all the stuff that happens in school. His potions teacher seems to hate him. Uh, Slytherin is winning all the awards. Uh, the murderous monster named Voldemort is trying to kill him. You know, just the little things that we all experience in everyday life. And it doesn't matter if your hero overcomes them or is overcome by them. The crises are merely those problems. And what interests us is to see people fighting those things. And then we come uh, to a very important moment, which is the climax. The climax purely means the biggest problem that your hero faces. So for Harry, this is when in the Sorcerer's Stone, he is face to face with Voldemort and he has the stone, the Sorcerer's Stone in his pocket and what's gonna happen, right? The, the climax is the moment where 
everything can be won or lost in this moment. And again, if everything's won, it's going to be a happy ending probably. And if everything's lost, it, it might be a tragedy, but it's still a, it can still be a good story. So that's the climax. And then, because Gustav Freytag was, uh, you know, German and also spoke French, he went all crazy and got us this French word, which I couldn't get the accent in there, and I can't pronounce French at all, but it's denouement, which means uh, the unraveling, the unraveling. And the idea here is all the things about the plot, all the things about the story that have been all uh, knotted up, that this is the moment when it all, all, everything is answered. Every question is answered, every crisis is solved or has harmed the character. Uh, every, in a, in a comedy, every person who doesn't have a romantic relationship gets one. In a tragedy, everyone who's alive is dead. <laughs> So that's the day. Well, it's the ending. It's what we call the falling action, meaning everything that kind of happens after the climactic moment. So let me just pause there for a moment to make sure you kind of have that preliminary situation, initial incident, and we go to crises, climax, day. Well, actually, maybe the easiest thing is let's walk through this one more time with a, a simple story that we all know. So I'm gonna I'm gonna use um, Red Red Riding Hood. Okay, we all know this story, I think, most of us, almost everyone. Uh, if you don't, it's pretty simple, so I think you can follow along. Little Red Riding Hood, what's the preliminary situation? What happens before the story starts? Well, there's this family living in the woods. There's no father, we're not told why. There's a girl who doesn't have a name. Uh, for some reason, she's named after her clothing, which would be the equivalent of my name being Blue Stripey Shirt. So, yeah, her name is Little Red Riding Hood because she has a hoodie. Um, she lives with her mom, and Grandma lives somehow during through these horrible, horrible woods, and Grandma is sick. These are all the things we know before the story starts. The initial incident is when Hood's mom comes to her and says, uh, Little Red, I want you to take this food to Grandma because she's sick. Why does Mom not go with her? I do not know. It doesn't matter. She says, go through the really terrible, dangerous woods. Don't speak to any wolves or other hungry animals that you might see, but instead go on to grandma's house. So that's the initial incident. In that moment, it starts the story. And in that moment, Little Red could say, no, I'm not going to do that. That's horrible, Mom. Why don't you go? You're an adult. But she doesn't. She says, okay, I'll do what you say. And then we, uh, she goes off into the woods. And then we start to hit the crises, the problems. And what are her problems? Well, First, a wolf comes up to her and starts to speak to her, and she's been told not to speak to it, so she has to decide, should I speak to it or not? It's a crisis. She says, I think I will. So she says, hide the wolf. The wolf says, I don't think you should go to grandma's. I think you should go through the woods and pick some flowers for her the long way. She has to decide whether to follow the advice of this horrible, hungry wolf. And she says, yeah, that sounds good. And she goes off into the woods. The wolf, meanwhile, runs to grandma's house, and in a bizarre series of events, either depending on the version you read, eats grandma, or locks her in a closet, and either way, definitely dresses up as her, uh, which is very strange. Eventually, Little Red arrives, and we get to the climactic moment, the climax, when Red begins to speak to who she thinks is Grandma, who must have been a very hairy woman. And she says, Ma, uh, Grandma, what big eyes you have, the better to see you with, my dear. Uh, what, uh, what big hands you with, the better to hug you with. Uh, and what big teeth you have, and Grandma says, the better to eat you with, at which point Little Red realizes something might be terribly wrong, and that is when she's devoured by the wolf. So, obviously, she fails in the climactic moment. Now, this story is a little different because in the denouement, uh, along comes what we would call a deus ex machina, which means the god out of the machine, which means there's a, a hero that comes from nowhere that's not part of the story and saves her. Uh, the woodsman comes in and cuts open the wolf and pulls out Little Red Riding Hood. So that, that's kind of how the story structure part works. That, that's, that's what it is. And we can put almost any story into this structure one way or another. And you can try that later if you would like. So let's try this with the story of humanity and the good news about Jesus. Okay, so we're going to take the big picture story. So there's the preliminary situation. God makes the world and everything in it, 
and he creates two human beings, Adam and Eve, and he puts them in the garden, and he says to them, you may eat from the tree of life all you like, but do not, under any circumstances, please, eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is a long enough name that you think they would have known better. But the initial incident comes really for the human race, not in the story of Adam and Eve, but the story of the human race, uh, according to scripture. The initial incident is when Adam and Eve fail uh, and they do take and eat from the fruit and they're kicked out of the garden. Humanity has become separated from God at the very beginning of our story. And, and the crises for the human race is this continual attempt to reconnect to God. So that could be things like, uh, let's build a giant tower and perhaps we'll reach heaven. It could be things like, uh, perhaps this son, his name is Noah, which means rest. Maybe he'll be the one to reconnect us to God, but he's not. We see that in his story. Uh, maybe if we follow all the rules, we'll somehow get to God. And so humanity goes through all these different ways of trying to connect with God. And over and over in these crises, they keep failing. But at the very beginning of our story, God had said that there's good news, that he would send to us someone who will reconnect us to God. And he does in the person of Jesus. And there, in Jesus' story has a, a variety of crises. If you look at the gospel story itself, the, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, those stories. But the climactic moment for all of humanity is this moment where Jesus is crucified on the cross because this is the biggest conflict in the history of humanity. Is God going to die? And what will happen if he does? And it's this shock to everyone that the story appears to be tragic because he does. He is. He's crucified and he dies. Now, we know uh, that the denouement, the unra unraveling, is partly when despite being killed in the climactic moment, that Jesus comes back to life and he says, look, you thought I was dead, but God has greater power than that, and he has now provided a way for you, regardless of who you are or where you've come from, to be reconnected to God. And that's the part of the story we're in now. Like in, For the story of the human race, we're in the denouement of our story. Now, it doesn't mean all of us aren't in the midst of crises, that we don't have our climax moments. We do. Uh, but that's the story of the good news for the human race. And when we talk to other people about the gospel, that's really the story, some part of that, in some way, is the story we're telling. God loved human beings. Human beings were broken. And we tried however we could to get to him, but we couldn't that Jesus came and died for our sins, that he died so that we could be healed, so we could be made whole, it's a climactic moment that leads into the denouement, where we have the choice, our climax moment maybe, of choosing whether to follow him or not. So that's how the, the big picture of uh, the world and humanity would work in this uh, explanation. So, Let's look at one more story, and then we'll talk about how this works in your story. Okay, so we have a woman who comes to Jesus. He's sitting out at a well. It's hot, and he's tired, and he sent his men into uh, this town in, in Samaria. Now, the Samaritans and the Jews, Jesus was a Jew, and the people in the town were Samaritans, had nothing to do with each other. In fact, we have an old prayer from the time from the Pharisees, who were Jews, that said, dear God, thank you that you didn't make me a woman or a Samaritan. There's, there was enormous hatred between these groups. Uh, they wouldn't speak to each other. It was normal for a Jewish person if they saw a, a Samaritan to literally look the other, other way. Maybe treat him the way some of us might treat a homeless person on the street. They would pretend they weren't there. So this woman comes out. Uh, so that's all, that's all initial or that's all uh, preliminary situation. What happens is this woman comes out, and the initial incident, what starts the story is not her walking out to the well, not that Jesus is there, but that Jesus looks to her and says, may I have a drink? He asks her, would you get me some water out of this well? And she looks at him and says, I thought you were a Jew. What business? Oh, you want a drink? Now you can suddenly talk to me? Oh, because you need something? 
she kind of says, what's wrong with you? You're a Jew. You can't even speak to me. How can you ask for a glass of water? And he says, if you knew who I was and who was asking, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If you, if you knew who I was, you would have asked me for water and better water than this, living water. And they get into this conversation that has a series of crises for this woman. She keeps trying to change the conversation. She says, well, this isn't how it works. You know, she's bringing up politics. She's bringing up old religious arguments between the Samaritans and the Jews, and Jesus keeps sidestepping them. She says, well, you, you Jews say we have to go worship in Jerusalem, and we say that we can worship here at Mount Gerizim, here in our hometown. And Jesus says, I, I tell you the truth, it doesn't matter if you worship here or there, because eventually uh, the true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. In fact, that time is right now. And throughout this thing, she keeps coming to what, she doesn't know what's going on. She says, tell me more about the living water. And he says, go get your husband, we'll talk more. And she says, oh, well, I, I'm not married. Right? That's how she tries to sidestep the crisis. And he says, uh, he, I'm sure he laughed at her because it's technically true. And he said, well, yeah, you're not married because you've had a bunch of husbands and the guy you're living with now is your boyfriend. So yeah, yeah I guess that's true. You, you're, you don't have a husband. Okay, I'll accept that answer. Uh, but what comes to this climactic moment for her is she says to him, I know one day, I know the story of humanity, and I know that one day there'll be this climactic moment where God will send someone to save us, to answer all our questions and bring us back into relationship with him. And Jesus says something he hadn't said to anyone at this point. He says, the person who's speaking to you, that's me. I'm that person. And for her, this climactic moment is, does she believe? Is she going to follow this man? And we know from the story that she does. She runs back into town and it says she told everyone what she had seen, the story. She told everyone about this man. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did, she said. This is in John 4, by the way. I should have said that earlier if you want to look at it later. Or right now, John 4. She says, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. And because of her story, many of the people come out to see him, and Jesus decides to stay there in town for a while. And it says that uh, toward the end of that time, people said, we no longer believe you because of what she has told us, but because we have seen it for ourselves, that you are the one sent from God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And that's pretty amazing. But I think what's really amazing is that her story was not just come see a man who told me everything I did. That's shorthand, for sure. She didn't say those exact words. So the question is, what story did she tell them? Uh, I, I think we know the story. Preliminary situation, I needed to go out and get something to drink. You all know my family situation. Initial incident, someone who shouldn't have spoken to me at all did and seemed to speak in a caring way. What does this reveal? God's love. God loves me. In the crises, we learn that she's broken, that she's living a hard life, that she's had multiple husbands, and we don't know why. They could have all died. She might not have done anything immoral, but the fact is she's living a broken, hurt life, and right now she's still hurting. And that in the midst of that, yes, you're broken, but Jesus said there's a way through this. There's someone who has all the answers, and I'm him. And her climactic moment was deciding whether to follow or not. So in the midst of her story, there's the truth of the good news of who Jesus is and what it means to follow. And that's true of us as well. Our story also has that. And I think we have another poll here. Let's throw that up real quick about our story and the good news. So it says, have you ever felt like your story reached its climax when you accepted Jesus Christ and everything else after it has been denouement, like it, it just hasn't been as important. So A, yes, B, no, C, I'm not sure, or D, Jesus Christ isn't a part of my story yet. Or maybe you haven't reached that climactic moment. In some way, you've not made a decision to follow, which is, that's fine. So go ahead and click on there and let us know where you fall on those questions. I'll give you just a moment here. Okay, the poll 
has ended. So I'm guessing we'll see some results in a moment here. So let me start with this. A lot of times when we talk about telling people our story about Jesus, especially when we talk about how do we tell people the gospel, the good news, a lot of times what we do is we say uh, the story of how we came to Jesus, where the climactic moment, like the Samaritan woman, is do I decide to follow this person or not? And for some of us, that's a really compelling and beautiful and amazing story because the story is, you know, oh, I, I think you guys actually talked to someone like this last week. I don't know if he shared his story, but his story is amazing. You know, he has drugs and guns in the trunk of his car and he gets pulled over by the cops and, you know, like all this kind of stuff. And then he comes to Jesus in jail. And I mean, an amazing story. Incredible. It's the kind of story that for someone like me who came to Jesus when I was five years old, that I'm like, okay, here's my story. I used to steal cookies when I was little, and then I prayed to receive Jesus, and then I still stole cookies sometimes, but I felt kind of guilty about it. Uh, it. You know, you're like, is that really the story I want to tell? And here's the thing. It doesn't matter. You don't need to tell that story. It's okay. The story of the gospel is not necessarily the story of your conversion to being a follower of Jesus, it can be just simply a story of transformation because you're in relationship with him. So it could be the story of uh, my parents got a divorce and that was really painful and that relationship was broken, but because I learned some things about loving and forgiveness through Jesus, I'm in relationship with my mom again now. Not so much with my dad, but with my mom I am. It's a story about brokenness and healing. And that's beautiful. And that is the good news. It's the gospel. It's the story of how Jesus is transforming your life. So let me just walk through quickly. Uh, oh, I see. I got a little confused on the poll. So the poll says uh, 44 of you said yes. You sometimes feel like the rest of your life's just been gaining long. Uh, 23 said no. 26 said that you're not sure. Uh, and, and then I got confused by this because about 60 of you put no answer, and I thought those were the people who said that they're not in relationship with Jesus yet. And I was like, that surprises me. Uh, but okay. Uh, but that was actually no answer, so there you go. So let's do this. When you tell your story, we're going to break into groups in just a minute here, and what I'm going to ask you to do is practice telling your story using these, uh, using this story structure. Uh, and what I want you to do is also, in the midst of your story, tell people uh, the kind of the basic four points that we talk about in crew when we talk about the good news about Jesus. God loves you. Humanity is broken. We can be in relationship with Jesus if we choose to accept his, uh, uh, you know, he died for us, and we can choose to be in relationship with him through prayer and a commitment to follow. So, uh, yeah, again, that could be uh, that can be told in a recent story or an old story or the story of your conversion or the story of something God did in your life last week. So here's what we're going to do. Preliminary situation, ask the question, where were you? What was going on in your life? You don't have to give a lot of detail. I had a friend who started telling the story of how she came to Jesus, and she literally spent 10 minutes talking about her and her dad going to this burger joint and what kind of burgers they got, and she doesn't like onions, and he didn't like pickles, but they accidentally switched them up and put twice as many onions on hers, uh, and, and it didn't matter because the story started when she got in the car later, and her dad said, do you ever think about spiritual things? You know, the hamburger, who cares? It wasn't, part, it, it wasn't compelling as a story. So don't get hung up on your preliminary situation. Uh, depending on your story, we may not need to know, you know, how many siblings I have, and how many kids I have, and you know, all those sorts of things may not go to your story, uh, the specific story you're telling. So think about that. Preliminary situation is something we barely speak about when telling a story. And then the initial incident is when Jesus speaks to you in some way, interacts with you somehow. It gets your story started. Your crisis, the conflict, is you dealing with that, trying to figure out, is that what I want to do, and what challenges come as a result of that? And the climax is really the moment where God offers you transformation in some way. 
And then the denouement is the invitation to say, this is when to the person you're talking to, the denouement is the place where you say, that's how my life was changed. Is that something you would want to? So your story will talk about when Jesus spoke to you, you dealing with that, the conflict, when he offered you transformation, and then for you to say, that's how I got through my brokenness. Is that something you want to do? And again, if you can get in there, God's love for us, uh, brokenness of humanity and of us as individuals, Jesus' death on our behalf, and, and the ability to make the choice to follow, that'd be great. So uh, the hero's story, let me, let me say two more things, and I'll, I'll send you off to groups. One is this. The hero's story is defined by whether she enters into the adventure that has been offered to her or whether he enters into the adventure that has been offered to him. And Jesus, in our lives, over and over, is offering us these moments of adventure. Do you want to be part of this uh, summer connection? Do you want to go on a summer project or stint like we heard about the Uruguay? Do, do you, are you going to follow Jesus in the way you love your family? These are adventures he's offering us. It's, it's being invited to enter into the story of the gospel. And I just want to encourage you to say yes. It's really, really worth it. You won't regret it. There'll be hard times for sure, but it's worth saying yes to him. So as we go off the groups, I want you in your groups to quickly, you don't have tons of time, for, uh, for, for you to start with volunteers, because for some people this will be weird. Volunteer to tell your story and help each other listen to each other's story. Help each other tell your story well. And then in chat, I'll throw my contact information in there. If you have questions in the weeks to come, you're welcome to email me or send me a note on Twitter or Facebook or send me a picture on Instagram, whatever. Thanks. Uh, we'll, we'll send you off to your groups now. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for sharing with us. Um, I think it's really powerful for us to have context that we are living in the larger story, God's story, and then how uh, God's story intersects with our lives. The gospel intersects with our stories uh, multiple places. Sometimes, you know, when we first inter introduce to Jesus and other times at uh, other points in our life, we're having to decide time after time to continue to follow him. The gospel story is meeting us in our own story. So thank you. If you are coming back from a group right now, thank you for coming uh, and joining us tonight, Sunday Night Live. Uh, we hope your discussion group went well, that you're able to share your story with one another, uh, learn some new things about each other. Uh, as I mentioned to, to the group that came back earlier, um, you can find out more of the information of the content for the week, of the watch, the listen, uh, the, the faith step. Uh, it'll be coming in your email, the little Syllabus will be coming in your email, and you'll have links to all that content, as well as your My Crew app will have your devotional, uh, your co-generous devotional. So make sure you check that out this week. And then be active on social media. We want to see what God is doing in your life. So if, if there's some fun things that happen, if you're learning some new things, if you uh, get to take a step of faith, get to share Christ with a friend, um, or get to share your story and, and how God's story has intersected with yours, we would love to know about that. So you can always post that on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter using the hashtag SummerConnect15 or your summer mission. So keep us informed on that. Um, and again, if you want to do the weekly challenge as well, uh, make sure that you get on Facebook tomorrow. It will be posted, um, the, the, the weekly challenge for this week. And there are some great prizes that you can win, and we will uh, feature you next week as one of the winners. Uh, so make sure you get on um, social media this week, do a post. And, uh, yeah, the, the post is share a post about something which you're thankful for to God. Um, that can be a lot of things. Uh, it's too bad you can't take a picture of your iPhone. I think that wouldn't work, but I'm thankful for my iPhone. So, anyways, uh, hope to see some of that stuff posted for your weekly challenge, and maybe you'll win a sweet prize. So, with that, um, we hope you have a wonderful night. Go watch the last quarter of the Warriors-Cleveland game. The Warriors. Good night.